Hello Biology 400 students, this is Mr. Gales. Today I'll be talking to you about crossing the membrane. This is screencast session number six in our Exploring the Cellular Basis of Life unit. So far in this unit we've learned about the history of cell biology with the development of cell theory. And we've learned about features common to all cells. We've learned about two major kinds of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. And we've learned about the most common eukaryotic cellular structures and their functions, what they do. In this final part of the unit, we're going to learn about how substances pass across the membrane to either move into the membrane or out. Uh, remember that the membrane is a semi-permeable barrier. We're going to talk today about what that means. So as we look at this particular screencast, learning targets that you should be aware of. We should be able to describe the role of the cell membrane in the maintenance of homeostasis and what that means, and why the cell membrane is described as fluid mosaic. We should describe how the phospholipid molecules orient themselves into a double layer when the plasma membrane is formed. Also, we should be able to describe and sketch the multi-molecular structure of the fluid mosaic model of the membrane. Uh, you ought to be able to look at a picture of the membrane and describe what you see. You should be able to describe the constituent parts, right? What, are the, what do the, each of the parts of the membrane do? You should be able to define cell transport and explain why it's crucial to the survival of cells. You should be able to explain why size and polarity are important in determining what substances can pass easily through the cell membrane. And finally, you should define permeability and describe why the membrane is actually described as a semi-permeable membrane. For those of you that like to use your textbook, uh, our textbook reference for this particular screencast is Chapter 3, Sections 1 and 2. It's pages 78 to 80, so it's a very short read. I would encourage you to do that. Also, in your unit packet, we're looking at pages 111 through 115. There are some diagrams uh, that might be useful for you. So as usual, make sure that you have your two-column note paper ready, that you can take uh, two-column notes. Main ideas go on the left. Supporting details, drawings, questions that you have go on the right. And uh, we'll get right to it. Okay, first main idea is the cell membrane. The role of the cell membrane. Uh, first of all, the cell membrane, in its very simplest sense, defines the cell's boundaries. It separates the interior of the cell from the external environment. Another major job of the cell membrane is that it controls interactions with other cells. One way that cells in your body are able to identify themselves to each other is through interactions at the cell membrane. And a final, and I think probably very important, job for the cell membrane is that it controls the passage of materials into and out of the cell. This contributes to homeostasis. Homeostasis is the stable set of conditions inside a cell or inside an organism that are required for life to be maintained. So for instance, cells we know need to be able to transport in raw materials. A great example of this is a red blood cell. It has one major job and that's to carry oxygen. So that cell needs to be able to have oxygen diffuse into its membrane. Um, Another example of a, a, a role of the, the membrane in terms of controlling this passage is simply controlling the quantity of particular substances that move through. Like muscle cells are going to require a, a large amount of glucose to move into the cell because they're going to require a lot of energy in order to do their work. Now the cell membrane, uh, today's model of the cell, cell membrane, the modern model, is referred to as a fluid mosaic model. And that's because it's constructed of a phospholipid bilayer, which is fluid, uh, the lipid bilayer has the consistency of uh, salad oil, like vegetable oil. Um, so that's the fluid part of it. Now the, the mosaic component of the model is that the, the phospholipid bilayer is studded with primarily proteins, but some additional molecules as well, like cholesterol, and occasionally you have things called glycolipids or glycoproteins. Those are either proteins or lipids that have carbohydrate chain, chains attached to them and play uh, important roles. Now the picture that you see on the screen here shows you sort of the fluid mosaic nature of the cell membrane. You can see the fluid, the little phospholipids are doing their dance, uh, the fluidity, and the mosaic aspect of it is the fact that there are these proteins embedded here in the membrane. Now this picture, and you have this picture on page 111 in your packet, this picture shows you a nice drawing of the fluid mosaic model of the membrane. And again, the major barrier, the major sort of basic unit of the membrane is the phospholipid bilayer that you see here. And then we look at, again, the mosaic nature of it. We have several different kinds of proteins in either embedded or running all the way through the membrane. Sometimes those proteins are stuck to the edges of the membrane, right? We have cholesterol that you see here, right? these orangish molecules. Uh, 
And then we have other structures like a glycoprotein, which is a protein that has a carbohydrate chain attached to it. There are many jobs that these proteins do, and we'll talk about that as we move through this uh, presentation. Now, I'm going to jump out of this real quickly and go over to a website. You guys will see this on one of the learning unit pages. This generally just sort of is an overview of cellular transport, which refers to the movement of compounds across the cell membrane. And we're going to look real quickly at the membrane itself, and you can see here the construction of the membrane. Again, the, the sort of phospholipid nature of it. If I zoom in real closely here, you can see that the, the membrane is in fluid motion. And you can see the, the phospholipids that are sort of moving back and forth. Uh, because of this fluid motion, the membrane is able to allow certain substances to pass through that we might ordinarily think would be blocked. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as we move through this presentation. Right. But a big idea is that the membrane is in fluid. It's a fluid, and it's in a constant sort of state of, of movement. All right, we'll go back over here to our presentation and move on to this next slide. Now, we talked about the proteins that are embedded in the membrane. There are six general types of proteins, and I think they're, the, the functions of those proteins is fairly self-explanatory. Some of the components of the learning unit that you're going to be looking at um, will describe the jobs of these proteins, but I'm just going to do a quick run-through on these right now with you. Transport proteins are involved in moving substances across the cell membrane that would not ordinarily be able to move across the membrane. So we're talking about larger polar charged molecules, uh, molecules that are ordinarily going to be repelled by the interior hydrophobic region of the membrane. And you can see this picture here. There's a, a channel that runs through that protein. Essentially what that means is the inside of that protein is likely hydrophilic or polar, and the outside of that protein here is likely hydrophobic or nonpolar to be embedded in the membrane. So this is a, a protein that's got a channel through which substances can pass. Some proteins on the surface of the, uh, of the membrane are involved in enzymatic activity. And we know that enzymes are involved in making chemical reactions occur more quickly. So certain enzymes might be involved in breaking down chemical substances to allow them to more freely pass into the membrane. Down here, signal transduction is one way that cells are able to communicate with their external environment or with other components of an organism. Uh, if there is a, a chemical signal like a hormone that is sent from one part of the body to another, that hormone might be uh, attracted to or attached to a protein on the surface of the cell membrane, and that would start the set, the, a signal to be sent into the cell for a particular job to be performed. So signal transduction essentially is a, a, a receptor protein uh, attaching to some sort of chemical and then sending a signal into the cell. We have proteins that are involved in intercellular joining. Uh, those proteins basically allow for the very tight connection between cells. This is important when cells join together to form tissues. Tissues are uh, groups of cells that all sort of do the same thing and have a common job. Cell-to-cell -cell recognition proteins. These are what we generally call the glycoproteins, a protein with a carbohydrate chain on it. These are um, proteins, uh, glycoproteins, that have the job of providing some sort of identification to other cells. So uh, very important job, for instance, would be to be able to identify your own body cells to your immune system so that your immune system does not attack, attack your own cells and break them down. That can be accomplished by cell-to-cell -cell recognition proteins. And then finally down here we have proteins that are involved in attaching the cell membrane to the cytoskeleton and to the extracellular matrix. And you can see here the cytoskeleton is that internal framework of the cell that holds things together. This protein would be involved in sort of attaching the membrane to that cytoskeleton so that there's some integrity to the overall cell. All right, so six major types of proteins, each having a very important job. I think the, the kinds of proteins that we're most likely to uh, focus on in our uh, unit here and in this presentation, the transport proteins play very important roles. And we may talk a little bit about enzymatic proteins and signal transduction as well. All right, one note about en uh, membrane fluidity. Phospholipids uh, have some fluid fluidity to them. They, are, they have a... a fluid nature. And you can see here that there's a couple of different kinds of movement that phospholipids may be able to undertake. Lateral movement is actually quite frequent, and the 
research suggests that the, the rate of lateral movement is up to about two micrometers per second. And that micrometer is a millionth of a meter, and that seems very small, but that's about the average size of a bacteria. And that's about how, the distance that these uh, phospholipids can move laterally per second. Another type of movement that can occur is a flip-flop, where the phospholipids actually sort of rotate in their orientation, and this is quite rare. Uh, but keep in mind that the, the phospholipids do, in fact, move. Now, membrane fluidity is measured by viscosity. Viscosity is a term which describes the thickness of the membrane or how fluid it is. So when we look at, at unsaturated phospholipid tails, like you see here, because of all the double bonds and the kinks in the phospholipid or in the lipid tails, the uh, molecules tend to be a little bit more spread away from each other, and therefore they're less tightly packed and they remain more fluid. In saturated hydrocarbon tails, the phospholipids are more tightly packed together, and therefore they tend to be more solid, more viscous. Organisms that exist in colder climates, and I'll give you an example of this fish, especially fish that live in cold water, tend to have a higher concentration of unsaturated uh, uh, lipids in their phospholipids, and that helps to keep their membranes from solidifying at colder temperatures. Now, cholesterol is found quite often in cell membranes, and the job of the cholesterol is to help stabilize the membrane and to prevent it from either over solidifying. So you can see here that it sort of packs in between those phospholipids and prevents them from becoming too solid, but it also prevents them from becoming too fluid. It makes it so that it's sort of just right um, in terms of the overall fluidity of the membrane. Okay, our next concept is membrane permeability. And when we talk about permeability, we're talking about whether or not substances are allowed to pass the membrane. Um, cell membranes are described as either being selectively permeable or semi-permeable. And what that means is that they, because of the chemical properties of the membrane, they allow certain substances to pass across the membrane. Other uh, substances may need some assistance to cross the membrane, and other substances are not really going to cross the membrane at all. And when we take a look at this picture that you see here, uh, this gives you a little idea of what we're talking about. Um, the plasma membrane, recall, has a hydrophobic region in the interior and a hydrophilic region on either the inside or the outside of the membrane. I'm going to jump out of the presentation here for just for a moment and show you on the camera uh, an example of what I'm talking about. Here's our phospholipid model. This is the bilayer model. Here are two individual phospholipids. You may recall from our organic chemistry unit that phospholipids are amphipathic. That means that they have a nonpolar region in the middle and a polar region on the end. Amphipathic means it's a molecule that's both polar and nonpolar. So when phospholipids form, they form together in this way where the, the tails end up lining up to each other. And what that does is it sort of uh, separates the hydrophobic barrier in the middle from the remainder of the molecule, from the hydrophilic part of the molecule, and that helps to separate it from water. So in terms of the lipid bilayer, you can see here a whole bunch of these joined together. We have our hydrophobic barrier here in, in the middle and the hydrophilic regions on the outside. The hydrophobicity of this interior portion is going to, in many ways, determine the polarity, I'm sorry, the, the permeability of the membrane. So I'm going to go back over to this just for a moment. Now some examples of substances uh, and whether or not they can cross across the membrane. If you look at the picture here on the far left, macromolecules have a difficult time across, going across the membrane because they're too large. They simply cannot fit through the membrane. Non-charged molecules, these could be nonpolar molecules or even small polar molecules that don't have ionic charge on them, they can fit through the membrane. They can fit through that, that the phospholipids because of the fluidity. And because of that, those non-charged molecules can go right through. Now, water is an example of that. Water is a polar molecule, but it's small, and it doesn't have an ionic charge on it. And so because of that, it's able to sort of squeeze between the phospholipids. Molecules, other molecules that are not going to easily be able to go across the membrane are charged molecules, things like ions, for instance, or larger polar molecules that may have a charge on them. Um, those substances are either too large or because of their electrical, their, because of the electrical charge that they have on them, they'll be repelled by the hydrophobic uh, barrier in there. 
So membrane permeability. The big idea is that our membrane, the membrane of biological organisms, is semi-permeable. And because of that, it allows or it helps with the maintenance of homeostasis. Right? The idea that we're going to take in substances that are required for life, like water, oxygen, nutrients, and we're going to, to take out of the cell products and waste materials. Now, what we'll finish with, this is sort of the last slide we're going to take a look at. Um, this is an overview of cell transport. We're going to look at two major types of transport. We have passive transport and active transport. And uh, these are the two major branches of transport. Obviously, you can see here that there are a few different kinds of passive transport that's being identified. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a diagram, this, actually this diagram that you have. This is page 115, so if you'd flip to that, I'm going to jump out of the presentation and go back to the camera here and just sort of talk through this diagram with you for a moment. We're going to start off with passive transport. First of all, passive transport is passive because it does not require energy in order for it to occur. That's because substances move from where there's a high concentration of them to where there's a low concentration of them. This is the natural tendency for molecules. If you think about it, when molecules are in high concentration, and they're all sort of randomly moving around because of the random nature of molecular motion, they tend to bump into each other because they're in close proximity. So they bump into each other, and as they bump into each other, they tend to spread out. So passive transport just follows the natural movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. And there are three types of passive transport that we're going to look, look at. We've got diffusion, which is just the movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. It could be, for instance, a gas molecule, something like that. The, when you're uh, popping popcorn in the microwave and you can smell the popcorn cooking from in your living room, that's because of the diffusion of the molecules. Osmosis is a special type of diffusion. It's the diffusion of water. So water moving from high concentration to low concentration. And then finally, facilitated diffusion. The word facilitate means to assist. So facilitated diffusion is diffusion, right, moving from high concentration to low concentration, but it uses a transport protein to move those substances across the membrane. Facilitated diffusion might be used to move a, um, a polar molecule that's a little bit larger, kind of like maybe a sugar, or it could be used to transport ions from high concentration to low concentration. Those would not ordinarily fit through the membrane or cross the membrane because of the hydrophobic nature of the interior there. Right? Now our other major type of transport is called active transport. Active transport requires energy, whereas passive transport did not. Active transport moves from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So you're going against the natural tendency. The reason that energy is required here, if you think about it, these substances, when active transport's occurring, these substances are moving from low concentration to high concentration. But the natural tendency will be for these molecules that are now in a higher concentration to simply diffuse back across the membrane. So energy is required to constantly be moving these molecules against their natural uh, tendency against their natural what we call concentration gradient. Okay, now the the source of energy that cells use for active transport is ATP. That's our cellular energy currency that we learned about in our thermodynamics unit. That's the kind of energy that's being expended here. There are a few types of active transport that we'll discuss. Uh, we have transport involving a pump. An example of that would be the sodium potassium pump that's involved in moving ions across the cell membrane, uh, very important in the transmission of nerve impulses. And then we have endocytosis, moving large bulk substances into the cell by moving the membrane, and exocytosis, which is moving them back out across the membrane. But a little bit more on that uh, later on in screencast session three. So for now, make sure that you've uh, got your notes well done. If you have any questions, make sure you bring them into class with you. And as always, we'll see you next time in biology.